Now moving to the connective tissues, um, types of cells that are in connective tissues. I know fibroblasts were mentioned, but specifically you should be aware that they are the ones that are secreting those fibers and there are different types of fibroblasts, which we're not going to get into, um, including collagen, elastin, and generally they have a uh, big star-like shape and are easily identified uh, under a microscope and tend to be the most common fixed cell within connective tissue. Mast cells, although they are a type of connective tissue cell, do not originate in connective tissues. They originate in the bone marrow along with other white blood cells. Uh, but once they take up residence in connective tissues, their job is to take part in inflammatory responses uh, by releasing heparin, which prevents blood clotting, so blood can move uh, more freely through an area where inflammation is being is taking place, uh, and release histamine. And histamine will uh, aid in the inflammatory response by dilating blood vessels, for example. And histamine is also involved uh, in promoting allergies, asthma, hay fever, which are not necessarily physiological responses, but more pathophysiological responses that cause problems in our body. And finally, macrophages, another type of white blood cell that does not originate in connective tissues, but uh, many of its functions are located within connective tissues. So what macrophages do is when they get the signal from uh, inflammatory responses, for example, they will migrate from the blood vessels into the connective tissue and by diapedesis and chemoattraction find their way to the area of infection, area of inflammation, and then scavenge up all of the um, either bacteria, if it happens to be bacteria, or all of the uh, dead cells that are in that particular area uh, and basically clean up the mess for the rest of the body and often when they say when people say that something is resorbed in the body usually it's macrophages coming up and cleaning up uh, whatever's left over that got broken down by other processes now as an introduction to various things you're going to we're going to talk about once we get to specific anatomy uh, are tissue membranes and tissue membranes are various types of membranes composed of epithelial tissue that provide some sort of function on the surface in which they are contained so some general types include mucous membranes and of course mucous membranes we know line uh, digestive, respiratory, urinary, reproductive tracts, and they have goblet cells within them that are secreting large amounts of mucus so that the surface of those uh, membranes is very uh, smooth and slippery, so things can move across them very easily. Serous membranes line uh, the pleura of the lungs, the peritoneal cavities, and the pericardial sac. And basically, serous membranes produce serous fluid so that when the lungs are expanding and contracting, when the heart is contracting and relaxing, when there is movement in the digestive system, uh, these two membranes with the serous fluid between them slide past one another and provide a frictionless movement to prevent injury while these uh, organs are moving. Uh, the cutaneous membrane, which is a skin, covers our body, offers protection. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory and will be talked more about in the skin section or integumentary section. And finally, synovial membranes, which are membranes that line the inner portion of joints. And they are the cells specifically that produce synovial fluid that lubricate the joints to aid in uh, friction-free movement. And so this slide is just showing you um, the various body cavities, uh, cranial cavity, vertebral cavity, pelvic, abdominal, thoracic cavity. And these cavities, especially the abdominal and the thoracic cavity, are lined 
by these serous membranes. And if you look at it, the serous membranes are basically a single sac into which the organ is inserted and there's that fluid in between that sac. Uh, similar to uh, what this picture shows if you were to put your fist into a fluid filled balloon. And again, as the heart is moving or as the lungs are moving, it prevents friction so there's not damage to the organ or the wall that is surrounding the organ uh, in, the pro in the process of moving. And finally, fascia, which is a type of connected tissue that is going to come up again and again and again when we get to uh, various regions of the body in anatomy. And so fascia we can think about it as superficial fascia, that which is most superficial, most towards the surface. Uh, remember, superficial versus deep. Um, typically, you'll find it between skin and the underlying organs. So here is between skin and underlying organs. And if you notice, just by looking at it, it contains mostly adipose tissue that is surrounded by areolar tissue or loose connective tissue. And often we more commonly refer to this as the subcutaneous or hypodermic layer. The deep fascia is underneath the superficial fascia, obviously. Uh, so, and there can be many layers to deep fascia. Typically you'll find it bound to capsules, uh, such as your joint capsules, tendons, and ligaments made up of dense connected tissue, the same thing that tendons and ligaments are made out of. Uh, and its job is to form a strong fibrous internal network that pretty much holds muscle and organs in place. So the deep fascia is really the integrity of your soft tissue in your body. And the last one is your subserous fascia, fascia, which if you're looking at this uh, from superficial to deep, it is the deepest type of fascia that is, exists in your body. And you'll find it just superficial to the serous membrane, all right? And it's composed of areolar or that loose connective tissue that kind of binds things together.